Oh, gee, thank you. I'm muted. Sorry, let's do it again. Welcome to week seven. I'm Professor Jennifer Harrison Hawa. Thank you for letting me know that I'm muted. Everyone can hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? Good. Yes. Moving on. Okay, you guys. So we have just a few things to, um, to cover. Um, if you could please just have out your um, case study. And then I wanna make sure we have sufficient time for that, but I do wanna go over a few things with us this morning before we get into our, I'm gonna put you guys into breakout groups and we'll do our, um, our case study. Okay. Everyone can see my screen? Budala, you're my you're my you're my go-to person because you're right underneath my my little picture. You can see the PowerPoint, everybody. Yes. All right, let's just jump right into it. All right, so let's talk about chapter thirteen for a moment. So what I did was I just put a, put together just a little. Um, presentation so that we can just make sure we um, hone in on some concepts for these chapters here. So chapter 13 is all about community assessment. And so what I like to, to, um, to drill into you guys is that you're, you're doing a, a community assessment is your, your head to toe on your community. What's this health status? What are things that are plaguing it? Just like you would go in and you do a head to toe on your patient, um, but there's things that you're gonna do first. Before you go into that room, you want to get some background information as well. So the public health, oh, I thought you had your hand up. A, the public health nurse is the most perfect person to do a community assessment because she's going to come in and she's going to intimately get to know her folks. The community is her client. All right. So again, she has a defined um, defined area and not going to get into that. Okay. Because you can define your area. You may have your supervisors say, I want you to do a community assessment on certain, certain street, certain, certain group. For me, like I, the easiest example is that when I worked on, a, when I work on a reservation, um, there are districts. So you can think of them as states, but they're not big. And then within the states, there are little, um, not little, there's um, villages. And so I may be designed to a district and so I did a community assessment years ago on everybody in that district, and I broke it down by, by villages. But a community simply is a group of people um, defined, a, that's in a defined population. So my folks would be the Guachi district, that's a name. Um, so those are the people I'm focusing on. I'm not focusing on um, another district. And they share something in common because they live in that district. So the location could be uh, how you define it, interest, values. And so you used your nursing process to do your head to toe of your people. Um, and so that's what that's all about. So you wanna define your community, all right? Keep in mind that the community is your, your client in room 101, if you wanna think of it that way. Always keeping in mind those healthy people goals or what have you, where the United States is like, this is this is what we want folks to be. We want them to be healthy in this, have redu reduced this, this, that, and the other. And so as you're doing your head to toe, you're coming up with data. But also beforehand, you've always done your, um, you, you can look at, um, uh, uh, records for death rates, you can look at birth rates, you can look at all of these different things beforehand, because there's always a place we can get information on your community. So you come in with, with, with 
doing your chart review. Yeah, I'll do that. You'll do your chart review, obtain data. You go out and you do your assessment. And based on that, if you look at, well, I can't point to it, prioritize problems, concerns, and partnership with the community. That is very, 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 very important. You're going to come up when you, you're going to come up with, um, through your review and through your community assessment, problems and concerns, but you need to bring that to the community and work in partnership with them on what their concerns are. There, you might be concerned that, um, that there's a high rate of um, diabetes based on your information, based on what have you, but then they're concerned because there's no safe place for them to walk because there's a lot of gang violence. So you, you're working in partnership because they live there, you don't. This is their community. You, you know, you're going to be gone. And so you want to prioritize the problems and concerns in partnership with the community. And then you want to get your key stakeholders. So your stakeholders are people, to me, what I say is like they have, they have street cred. They're the ones that, it may be a clergyman, it may be whomever the people hold in high regard as someone they're going to listen to because they don't know you. And so why should they listen to you? And so that's um, you want to get people on your on your A team. That was an old show. On your A team to work with you on identifying these problems and concerns in conjunction with what you found. And then, believe it or not, there's always a nursing diagnosis, and you may have several nursing diagnoses or what have you, and you prioritize them as well in conjunction with the community. And, 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 and you know, things may come into play to where, um, I don't wanna get into it too much, but um, how you prioritize and what, which one you do first, that's, that's, not, that's not as important as knowing the, the, the flow on how you're gonna do the community assessment. The little neat details, that's something else. And then again, it's like you're doing a care plan. So the last one at the bottom green square is you're gonna plan, what are your goals? What are your objectives? What are your interventions? You know, just like when you're doing that care plan and how do you evaluate? I remember, um, I don't wanna talk about the past test too much because it's over and done with, but there was a question about how would you, um, it was a parish nurse and how would you evaluate the effectiveness, something with diabetes. But the bottom line is, is that you want to go back and, you know, so something about six months later, you're going to review numbers from glucose or something like that. Because that's how I know in clinic if someone's um, actually doing what they're saying, because other than that, it's just words. But I want to look at your blood. I want to know what your trends are. Um, because if you really are following through with the plan I gave you for your diabetes, your A1C should come down remarkably. And if you're taking your medicines and doing everything that you're saying, other than that, it's just words. I, I, the proof is in the pudding. So that's why you need physical data to show that you actually are making a difference. All right. So then moving on, let's go on to chapter 14. So chapter 14 Chapter 14, you guys dealt with health education in the community. So here we go. Budala, what's the difference between education and learning? Education is, uh, should be like the process through which you obtain new information. Yes, sir. And then learning is what? is what you actually acquired. Very, very good. I almost could have said, perfect, 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 perfect. I wish I could give you a little start. Ding. So educate, and you're probably like, well, it's good. No, no, it's actually in your chapter. I read your chapters. Education and learning are different. Education is what I am trying to do, is educate. 
education is the establishment arrangement of events to facilitate learning. Like I am educating you right now. Learning is you. Something triggers and you get it. And so I know you get it by your exams and some other stuff. Like right now, when I ask you like an off question. And so learning is the process of gaining knowledge and expertise and results and behavioral change. That's why I like to do this critical thinking. So when you're working with your communities, one of the things that the text mentioned is that you want to, um, there are two barriers um, they, they talked about with learning, low literacy level, um, especially health literacy. With health literacy literally means that, you know, they're understanding the information, the health information you're providing to them. So then you want to break it down or up based on your client. Your client is the community. So those are things that you want to know when you're presenting your information. If you're doing you're doing your teaching, if it's too up here, or sometimes it's too down there. Like when I go into um you know, when I go into, you know, for an appointment or something, I don't tell anybody I'm an NP, you know, I have my jeans on, a t-shirt, and um, they'll, they'll, they'll talk to me. In my mind, it's ba I call it baby language. And then I'll, I'll let them just talk. And I'm like, okay, this is really, I'm like, I get it. <laughs> I said, like, I'm an MP. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't mean to use baby. I said, you can bring it up a little bit. Bring it up. <laughs> it's just like, it's like you're talking to me like I'm two. Um, and and so that's that's what you want to keep in mind for your community. So what is the best way? What how do you determine the best method of education for community? And that's just that you have to when you do your assessment on your community. All right. And then you you may do PowerPoints. They they you can just you can just literally ask. You may do PowerPoints. You may do brochures. You may do um, um, uh, individual or group things or what happens. But you want to find out what works for them. Is the bottom line, period. And so, education examples of education from a primary and secondary and tertiary. Let me just, again, I, your own education, I think that trips a lot of people up on the test because they see in education, they automatically think primary. But as nurses, future nurses that I know we're all are going to be, you're going to always educate. It doesn't matter if they're on their deathbed. It doesn't matter if there's a fresh baby out of the womb. You're always they're going to educate. The most important thing you want to remember is where are you on the prevention level? And so what tripped a lot of people up is like obesity is a disease. So that's a diagnosis. I've been diagnosed with obesity. I know, may not look it, but I am. And so um, drug addiction, that's a diagnosis. And methadone addiction, a methadone dependence. That's a ICD-9 code. I don't know if they do an ICD-10. I don't know what they're doing. So those are things that if there's a diagnosis present, you're going to educate because you're always educating. That's what we do very, very well. But what level are you on that? On that? Are you primary? Are you secondary? And are you tertiary? So moving on to um, chapter five. So with chapter five, it, um, let me just get to my to my notes here. Chapter five was really interesting because it really harped upon the the different um, how healthcare disparity really impacts um, healthcare in our country. So when you're thinking of healthcare disparities, it literally is a difference between differences among populations. So if you're comparing blacks and whites or Mexicans against African-Americans or this or that or the other. Um, healthcare disparities are literally differences among population groups in the availability of a resource. Do they have availability for, where's the pharmacy? Where is the nearest hospital? Like one of my villages literally is over two hours from the nearest hospital. It's two hours from my hospital on the reservation 
and it's another two hours to like a level one trauma center. So that's four hours. So I'm always at my desk and I'm like here in the helicopter, not every five seconds, but enough during the shift. I'm like, well, dang, what's going on today? Um, so healthcare disparities. And so the availability of resources, the accessibility of resources, the quality of healthcare, especially that's aimed at prevention and treatment. Are they able to get screenings for mammograms? Are they able to get treatment for their diabetes ulcer? Where, you know, where is it located? You know, you know, how many are there providers that can do this specialty? So this disparity between those the haves and the and those that have not in relation to healthcare. How are they able to manage their diseases in comparison to that group and complications? Um, dialysis, we actually have a dialysis unit in the middle of nowhere that the, the tribe um, petitioned to have put out there because of the high rate of diabetes, the highest, they have the highest incidence. The, the group that I worked with when I did my paper when I was working on my master's in public health years ago, they had the highest incidence and prevalence of, of type two diabetes compared to any group ethnicity in the entire Marble galaxy, whether they were in Florida or in the middle of the Amazon. So they, of course, with unfortunately with complication of diabetes, there's a lot of folks on dialysis. And so they had a unit, a dialysis, uh, Davida built out there and that really helped them a lot as far as with that healthcare disparity is concerned. So um, in relation to, uh, let me see, where would I wanna go with this? Mm, what are two, so um, let me just go to um, Ms. Del Cole. Give me one law that helped is helping with address the, the healthcare disparity. You mentioned it in your chapter. There was a policy. I'm not sure. Okay, you're not sure. Anybody want to volunteer to help her out? Would it be the Affordable Care Act? Yes, who said that? Who was that? I have a screen really small. Who was that? Michaela. Michaela. Yes, yes, the Affordable Care Act. Yes, yes, yes. Um, it was signed by Congress in 2010. Your book, textbook talked about it resulting in a greater emphasis on access to care. So you wanna get folks access to care, leading them, leading to improvements in prevention of illnesses, patient outcomes. There was another one that the text mentioned, not as possible as they're not as, not as popular, slow down, popular as the Affordable Care Act. Does anyone remember what the other one, there was two reform laws. You may see this again. Anybody remember? The text talked about the Prevention and Public Health Fund, which was part of the 2016. It wasn't as popular like whatever, but the text messages just so though. So these are so these questions that I'm pulling are actually from your um from your text. I'm not making them up. I promise you. Well, um there's a anyway. So the the public fund was part of the uh, 2016 act was designed to invest in public health and communities. So the Affordable Care Act and then the um, Prevention and Public Health Fund. These were three things, two things that were mentioned. So we talked about it a little bit, but Ms. Eden, how does poverty, does poverty negatively or positively impact health? Why or what not? Ms. Eden, are you with us today? Let me see. Sorry, it wasn't unmuting. Um, I think that it negatively affects it because people with poverty don't have as much resources for insurance and health care. 
Absolutely. So things tend to build up and muster and they end up in ER with complications that could have been, what's my favorite word? Prevented. Absolutely. So then this one's a, it's a little bit more, the, the factors that affect resource allocation in healthcare. So let me just kind of try to break that down a little bit. Allocation is money. So how is how is money what are the factors associated with with the 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 spendings for healthcare? I guess that's that might be a better what have you. So you got to look at how is healthcare, you know, how is it how what is the money coming from? It's coming from private insurance, okay? So then you're looking at um insurance, blue cross blue shield, you're contributing, if you're an employer, you're, you're contributing to your health care because money's coming out of your check. Um, there are managed care um, HMOs that are out there. Um, they decide how to distribute the monies that they get from the employers and the employees and what have you. And so um, although insurance consumers have been prominent, is the pay is the money that you're putting in into these private insurances and how it's being distributed out by that by Blue Cross Blue Shield by they there so these companies they're getting money from the employer and they receive money from the employee they contribute into this into this fund and so they just they decide however they decide how much they're spending to allocate for screenings for testing and that sort of thing as well and then um let me see what else do I want to talk about um the issue again with just touch upon with with poverty is that you know if you um your associate your your low socioeconomic status, being poor, it determines your ability to purchase insurance to begin with or get that. And that's what I think Ms. Eden touched, touched upon, to pay directly for those out-of-cost things and what have you. And so our country, you know, it runs on, you know, the, you know, health insurances and what have you. So if you if you're able as a public health nurse, you want to make sure that you can link them to those resources to get them into um, the, affordable, the, the different plans, if they qualify for or whatever services they qualify for, you want to try to get them into some type of um, some type of plans for their for their health care needs. And so what was I going to mention again? It left me. So your private and your public health insurance, as we mentioned that in the previous chapters, but the lack of the ability, the lack of health care, especially among the poor, is a huge factor in their uh, health status. And then it kind of switches a little bit. And then we talk about um, groups that are we talk about violence and human abuse. So unfortunately it is a leading cause and we're gonna talk, that's our, our case study. Unfortunately, violence and human abuse is a leading cause of death and disability. And so as far as what groups are dis, disappropriately, disproportionately affected by violence, Ms. Gore, give me one group that comes to mind. A group, or like, um, when you think of violence, <clears throat> I would say um, the homeless, probably. Okay, no, 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 you that absolutely, my dear. Thank you very much, Manisha. Give me another group. Um, low income population. Look at you. Somebody read this chapter. Miss Mount, you want to give me another one? Um, could it be um I don't know. Like adolescents? I don't know. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm sure it's in there. It's 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 in there as well. 
Miss Blair Cunningham. Like single parent households? Single parent household. The text mentions youth, low income populations, and people of color. I mean, un unfortunately, anyone can be, but, but as far as disproportionately uh, affects the youth, low income populations, and people of color. And so, what is the difference, Miss Delay, between non fatal versus fatal violence? One ends up in death and one doesn't. That's true. <laughs> one ends up in death and one doesn't. It actually was a critical um, thinking question. So in non-fatal non violence, um, I'm reading my notes from your checks. In non-fatal violence, including child, maltreat child maltreatment is non-fatal violence, youth violence, intimate partner violence, sexual violence, elder abuse. Um, that's what you're, that's what you're looking at there. Fatal suicide. Homicide. And homicide. Kill yourself, kill somebody else. Don't want to kill anybody. Kumbaya. Miss Nickerson, what is human trafficking? Uh, it's an umbrella term that encompasses um, recruiting people, selling people. There's a couple other things in there. Um, I think you transport them as well. You have a good memory because you actually use the words from the text. Do you have a, do you have like a photographic memory? Seriously. <laughs> Mildly. If I write it down, I can usually picture yeah. it. So it literally says human trafficking is an umbrella term. That's all like. She's reading my mind. It's an umbrella term that includes activities involved in recruiting, harboring, transporting, or providing an, providing an individual for forced service or commercial sex acts through the use of force, deception, or coercion. Um, so the questions that they, they tend to ask, I remember writing them down in your text is like, if you know if you're um, if you're doing an assessment of someone that you suspect human trafficking, one of the things the text says is a question you can ask is, well, can you come and go from your home or job whenever you please? Has anyone at home or work ever physically harmed you? Have you been threatened for trying to leave your job? Is anyone forcing you to do things you do not want to do? Do you have to ask permission to eat? sleep or use the bathroom? Are there locks on your doors and windows that keep you from leaving? Have you ever been denied food, water, sleep? Has anyone ever threatened your family? Has anyone taken away your identification part, uh, cards, papers? Um, anyway, so so that's the example of the, 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 the screening questions they mentioned in the chapter as well. Um, and so for child abuse and neglect, I'll give you I'll give you this one. Yeah, you have to report it. We're mandated reporter. Nurses are mandated reporters. Um, and so I don't want to go down that road too much. But if you suspect abuse and neglect, you got to report it. And I know you're like, uh, but you you we do we do. Where they were like, oh, she's just trying. Some you have to report it. Um, so so that's so that's that there. Risk factors for child abuse. Does anybody want to tackle that one? And so who wants to give me one example for a risk factor for child abuse and from the angle of the caregiver? So, I mean, like if, if, if you suspect the caregiver is abusing your child, what would be a risk factor? And risk factor are things that can lead to something, unfortunately. History of uh, family abuse in the caregiver's family. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Um, 
what is it? Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, that's my alarm to 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 start. Stop talking as much and and get ready for because this um, case study is going to take us a few. Let me just go into infectious disease a little bit, just a little bit in your chapter eleven. Um, the take away, the takeaway from what I got from your chapter is a lot of these conditions are preventable. So then you want to come in with that in mind as far as when you're you're working with your population. You want to always teach and educate about um, washing hands, safer sex practices, do this, don't do that. Um, risky sexual behavior and that sort of thing. So then, um, when you're when you're um, noticing, I remember with our syphilis outbreak, little syphilis outbreak when I first started with the reservation, is that one of the public health nurses sounds like textbook, but she noticed that there was an increase in. Um, it was kind of like the 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 water the the first case study we did. She noticed there was an increase in syphilis cases um, in this one um, in village that she was working in, and like, oh, that's like I don't know what. Let's just say two in one day, and so she started doing screenings out there, and that's how things kind of rolled from there. And so, um, you. If you find that there are a number of cases, of course, you do your, you, you, wherever is that, you want to break it, stop it from spreading. You want to break the chain, so to speak, and just kind of get in there and do your, do your prevention work, wherever level that is. Um, the text mentions effective intervention measures um, include uh, individual and community at breaking the chain of the triangle from the agent, the host, or the environment. So then wherever that needs to be focused on is, is your um, goal. And you need to be, I always say like, I'm always, you always wanna have your spider senses up. You always wanna be constantly vigilant and aware of things. Again, especially if you decide, you know, you may decide you wanna be a public health nurse because um, again, largely they're preventable. Um, through primary prevention, that's where we want to live as far as our education and teaching and what have you. But you're starting to have outbreaks and you're going to be doing a lot of screenings. You're going to be, you know, folks are being diagnosed and you're at tertiary and preventing complications. So um, that's that's what you want to do is try to prevent whatever level you're on and break that chain wherever you are on that triangle. Um, so I'm gonna move through this pretty quickly so we can have time for our case study. So we've heard about HIV for, I don't know, I remember when I was an LPN back in the early nineties is where it's just like every other patient. So it's a virus, it attacks your immune system, okay? If it's not treated, it can lead to AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. There is no cure for HIV, but with the medications, it can be controlled. Um, and then STDs, again, they tend to affect younger people more so than older, but anyone can, can get an STD. And um, Risk factors, unfortunately, tend to be in minority groups, folks living in those in urban settings. But again, my reservation kind of, you know, they weren't in an urban setting. Um, so never um, being impoverished, the chapter mentioned using crack cocaine. That's what the chapter mentions. Um, a serious complication besides death is that... Um, Unfortunately, I see a lot of women with PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, because those bacteria and stuff infect, get up in there and start wreaking havoc on fallopian tubes and stuff, ectopic pregnancies, and neonatal death, and that sort of stuff. So it's important um, to early detection, 
of course, screenings and what have you, education, prevention, prevention, prevention. Um, the difference between asymptomatic and symptomatic, anybody want to tackle that one? Miss Tika? Asymptomatic is when you have it, but don't show signs and symptoms. That is true. And symptomatic, you show symptom. That is, yep, yep, perfect. Uh, I think I talked about complications of STI. One serious one is death. Um, again, early detection is important so that we can reduce complications and get folks into treatment um, sooner, okay? So we can prevent things from happening to them. And that's that's pretty much a little summary of, um, of our chapters. I do want to get us into, let me get into our case study. If you wanna go ahead and pull that out, I'm going to put you guys into random groups for a few minutes, about a good 30 minutes. Go through your case studies and we'll bring back and get it wrapped up. I do have... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thought I had it pulled up here. Give me one second. That's my parent book six, six and seven. Hang on one second. I had it pulled up. Let me find where I did with it. Give me just a moment. You guys have your copies of it? Yes. Okay. All righty. At least one person in your group should have it. And I'm just literally just going to be assigning groups. I'll see you guys back in 30. Um, I'll be checking on you through your groups, through the breakout rooms. Um, all right, here we go. Let me see this. 14, 14 people. Three or four group. I'm just randomly clicking. Randomly clicking. Wherever my mouse takes me. La 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 la. Be nice to each other. I'm sure you will. One group is gonna have um two people. It's okay. We got this. Because we're round robin the questions. So it'll be it'll be fine. It'll be fine. You go.
What room were you in, Katie? I don't care. Sorry, my computer rebooted. I don't know why. Um, I was with Tika and Megan. Okay, let's get you. It's okay, it's all good. Uh, la, 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 la. Tika and Megan. Uh, let me see. Room five. There you go. You should be off soon. Good luck.
Welcome back. Welcome, welcome. Let's give others a few minutes to, to join us. Angela and Sam. All right, you guys, it looks like we have, I see all of your beautiful faces. Well, a couple of people. All right, you guys, this is a this is a deep cave study. Let's just get right into it. So let's get into number one. Alexandria, I don't think I've heard from you today, my dear. Go ahead and read number one and let's just get right into it. Question number one. Miss Alexandria. There you are, Miss McDowell. I can see the top of your braids. There you go. Read number one for me and let's talk about it. Do you have it in front of you? You on mute? My there bad. It's all what right. Behavior? What behaviors might Angela display that could indicate she is experiencing intimate partner violence? <laughs> Kevin Marie. Are you raising your hand up to God? Who are you talking to? I think, I she's, think she's talking, talking to, her to her child. Okay. I hope they're listening. Okay, we're back. What's your answer for one, my dear? Um, we said not making eye contact, uh, trying to make excuses, her story not lining up with her injuries. <laughs> Absolutely. Her partner got to be there for everything. Mm -hmm. Lack of eye contact, we said too. Yes, yes, all of those are great, great answers, you guys. And unfortunately, one of the one of the things they said here is that violence, if it's there, not for everybody, it tends to escalate during a pregnancy for whatever reason. But good answer, good job, you guys. So let's now move. I'm just looking at people I haven't talked to today. Miss Lynch, what's your num your group's number two? Yes. Um, considering the determinants of health for this family, bio biology, individual, fam individual behavior, health services, social factors and policies, what are the risk factors for experiencing intimate partner violence? We said uh, young age, low self-esteem, isolation from friends, history of abuse, whether that be the actual patient herself or her parents, and uh, unhealthy relationships. Spot on. And actually, I like the very first sentence. It says anyone can experience domestic violence. That's what I, that's like the thing. But there are some folks that tend to be, you know, that's the risk factors there. And everything you guys said was, was spot on. And then, thank you very much, Miss Gore. Number three, if you could tackle that one. Yeah, number three, um, how would you assess for physical violence? Um, we said we would ask um, a lot of questions, you know, like, do you feel safe in the home? Um, is anyone hurting you? Are there any specific factors of where the violence is coming from? You know, just those normal questions those they ask you questions. no absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. Everything i don't know there. if there's like a list and, of what it's called no 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 um, that's, then, those course, are, that's actually skin. good because for me if i suspect something well anything i you have to build a rapport with people that they trust to tell you anything anything in in life healthcare, what have you so it's just starting to ask questions and what have you that that um and building that relationship yeah good 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 and then Miss Murray, I don't know if I heard from you today. Can you tackle number four for your group? Yeah, I was in the same group as Tiaja, but you haven't heard from me today. But oh yeah, I was trying to like uh, uh, okay. okay. 
Over the next couple months, the PHN continues to see Angela for the pregnancy follow-up. She is now eight months pregnant. Angela has had to cancel three appointments because Sam now refuses to let the PHN in the home without him present. After at the last visit, the PHN arrived at the door and Angela told her Sam was out with friends and she was unable to let her in. How might the PHN respond to Angela? I said it would be important to reiterate that prenatal care is really important for her to have. Right. It's important for the baby to be checked out and Sam isn't in the home anyway and that it would just be quick and she could be in and out. Absolutely. Yep, yep, yep. Listen without judgment. That's one of the things. And in life, listen without judgment. Um, and then um, it says, many myths persist about women and men who are abused in relationship. Because I've, I've dealt with men that were abused by their partner, male or female. Um, and so, again, yeah, listening without judgment and, and not assuming. Good, 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 good. Miss Tika, have I heard from you today? Um, I think I'm gonna hear from you again. Or maybe I didn't hear from you. I don't know. Are you can you tackle number five? Yeah. Which statement below best describes the PHN's legal reporting obligation in the state of Minnesota? Um, our group picked A. I'm sorry, I'm just like uh, A is correct. Uh, the PHN is not mandated to report suspected abuse unless they suspect there was a weapon involved. Well, I didn't know that about the weapon, but yeah, yeah. Very good, very good, very good. And so have I heard from, I think I've heard from everybody in their groups, right? Let's just round robin at this point here. So um, number six, during the... Um, during the time the PHN has seen Angela, she has presented with a broken finger, a displaced shoulder, an injured foot, and a laceration on her arm. Because Sam has always been present for the visit, the PHN is unsure of the true nature of the injuries. Today, Angela calls the PHN. So Angela's calling the PHN to come for a prenatal visit. Oh, she now she trusts her. She's picking up the phone as soon as possible. The PHN arrives and Sam is not present. So number six, which of the following assessment question is most important for the PHN to ask Angela? Who wants to tackle that one? Is it A? Oh, yay. <laughs> Who was that, Miss Mount? Was that Miss Mount? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that was me. Talk to uh, read number A for me, dears. Thank you. Thank you for volunteering. I was looking at my my list like Santa Claus. Um, A says, Angela, you have had several injuries these last few months. When I see injuries like these, I become concerned that someone's hurting you. Are you in a relationship with someone who is hurting you? I love that number. The answer. A is the most appropriate question to ask. The PHN may be the only person aware of Angela's abuse. If Angela is not ready to acknowledge the abuse or leave Sam, it is crucial to let Angela know someone is concerned for her welfare. It is also important to ensure that Angela will have contact with someone besides her abuser after she walks out the door. Schedules a follow-up appointment to make sure this happens. The goal, hang on one second, I'm parched. The goal is not to convince Angela to leave Sam or it actually has fixed the problem. However, there is a re responsibility to inquire about suspected abuse. Document was learned and provide the client with information and support. This support begins with ensuring that Angela knows someone is concerned and will support her. Very good, very good. So then for number seven, Angela reports Sam has been physically abusing her. Okay, now she's now she's talking, but she is not yet willing to leave. 
What might the PHN discuss with her at this point? Who wants to give me the answer? Safety plan B. Okay, who's this? Miss Delay. Excellent. B is the most correct response. Developing a safety plan will help Angela be safe while, leaving, while living with Sam and help her identify the safest time to leave should she, should she decide to do so. Leaving Sam is a process for Angela. She cannot acknowledge that Sam abuses her and then immediately be uh, prepared for the upheaval of finding a new place to live. Very good. Number eight, what are the elements of a safety plan? Now, I know we didn't discuss all this, but who wants to try to tackle that? If you were helping someone develop a safety plan, and usually, honestly, I call my social worker, but then if, if she's busy, we have the nurses, if you don't realize you, you wear 10 gazillion hats. So a good safety plan might have what information? Resources she could call or use if she would need to escape. Yes, ma'am. Somebody else was talking, was it just you? Okay. Yeah, I was saying our group said um, about how you can deliver, like order a pizza to 911 if you're not able to. I like that. <laughs> I like that. I don't know why I do because we tend to order pizzas because mom's busy sometimes, but I I like that. Or actually call the pizza company and like <laughs> pepperoni. 24, 10. Large. I like that. Um, it says a safety plan is a personalized, personalized practical plan that includes ways to remain safe while in a relationship, planning to leave or after you've left. So there's different stages. Safety plan involves how to cope with emotions, tell your friends and families about the views, take legal action. A good safety plan will have all the vital information you need be tailored to your patient. And um, uh, although some of the things that you outline in your safety plan may be obvious, it's important to remember that in moments of crisis, your brain doesn't function the same way as when you are calm. When the adrenaline is pumping, it can be hard to think clearly or make logical decisions. I can relate about your safety plan. Having a safety plan laid out in advance can help you to protect, help to protect yourself in these stressful moments. Like, okay, I got you. This, 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 this. Um, a week after the PHN's visit, Angela calls and informs the PHN Sam hurt her again and has threatened to kill her if she leaves. When the PHN asks Angela if she's okay, she says she is fine and just needs to get herself together. She says she will be home at noon and ask the PHN to visit. Number nine, what precautions can the PHN take to ensure her own safety? And so that's another thing to remember. I have gone out to homes, I'm not going to make this about me because it's not about me, where um, I knew the dog didn't like me and I had asked her to put her little chihuahuas on me and he got me on the, on the way out. He was sneaky. I was going back to my government Jeep and he snapped me right in my ankle and I could see the blood from my sock. And I said, I want you to put your dog, you know, he doesn't like me. And she's like, mm. I said, tell me this dog has had his shots. Tell me your dog has had his job. This is not funny. She was laughing. Anyway, what precautions can the PHN take? Mm, Udala. Uh, Give me one thing. You don't have to tell me. Oh, okay. You're going out there. She's telling you that this person wants to kill her. So you got to protect yourself. I said you have to keep you are funny you all the time. Yes, 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 yes. Make sure you have a cell phone, take a dispatch radio if allowed by your organization. 
Make sure that someone else knows your agency. Make sure someone else from your agency knows the address and how long you plan to be there. Uh, your own safety comes first. If you feel uncomfortable after considering the above item, you do not have to go. Other options include have the police meet you at the site, meet in public, and you know, meet me at the McDonald's around the corner, or what have you. Because again, you're you know you're trying to protect Angela, but who's going to protect you? Um, so we used to cover. We used to have our cell phones. We had radios in our Jeeps. Um, my secretary was really, really awesome. She was from that, um, she's Native American. So she knew how long it would take me to get somewhere and come back. And she was like a mother hen. She would start calling. Um, so then I'll do number 10. So find your agency policy. policy. Everybody has a policy. There's policies for policies. Um, the, the PHN determines it will be safe to visit Angela in her home. When she arrives, Angela states that she is afraid, afraid, and they call the police. So the legal response, what legal responsibility does the police off, officer have when responding to this call? So then the off number C, the officer is legally responsible to make sure Angela is okay. Okay, so that's that's that. Um, resources, what resources would um, might be might you as a PHN? And this I used to. You 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 have to be whenever you're out in the community, you gotta know where the nearest this that and the other is. It may take you some time, but what is a resource you're gonna offer her? Shelter. Yes, get her support group. Yes, 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 all day, all day, all day. So family members and friends, homeless shelters, battered women services, including women's shelter, churches, legal system, social services, support group. Absolutely. And then it just talks about the an, an article that you guys do not need to even worry about at this particular time. And that concludes our class, you guys, for week seven. Please make sure that you do your peer review um, and post that. And Can you then, go over that a little bit? Because some of us are confused about it. Yes, yes, about the actual peer review. Yeah. About what you're supposed to do or, or what? So you want us to evaluate the other, say if we had a group of three, the other two people in our group as well as respond. So so I canvas. did get some, yeah. So so you the peer review is actually separate from the this. So you have your discussion and then you have your responses. And then your peer review is actually you reviewing, and you can review other team, another team if you if you want. I'm following the guidelines by Fortis, but a peer review is actually the only time during the class when you you review somebody else's work, and you critique it, if that makes sense. I've had people and there's two people in a group. And I was like, you know, pick someone else's paper from another group, pick Ebola or pick RSV or pick something else. So as, as you have your discussion and your responses, and then you have your document with your peer review, that's a separate um, submission. So there's two, they're all part of your assignments for this week. The discussion question is your infectious disease and people respond to it. And then you respond to other, you know, your two responses. And then you have your peer review. And so they want you, I mean, most of these groups have three people. So they they would like for you to, but if it seemed redundant, like some people, I don't know, like when I used to do these, I I would say, you know. Part of the time I wrote most of it and the other person did part of the work and did the references and made it look all nice and cute. You know, I'm good at like, here's the rough draft, make it pretty. And so 
reviewing myself is not what I want to do. So if you know that in your group, you did most of this, that, and the other, it's like you're reviewing yourself, then pick another paper. That's perfectly, that's perfectly fine and acceptable. Um, because your, if your infectious disease, um, should look the same as everybody in your group because everybody's posting it. So then you're going to respond to another group. Okay. So that's, so that's that, but the actual peer review, if you guys know that, like you, if let's say Shirley, if you actually did most of the writing, you know, putting it together and then somebody just sent you the information, I don't know how you did it or what have you, then it seems like you're going to be reviewing yourself because you, you did most of the, the putting it together Then pick another paper. That's fine. Okay. It's all good. It's all good. As long as I see a peer review. <laughs> um, Excuse me again on the peer review. Hmm? So I, again, have a, I have a question also. I read somewhere where let they me, say- Let me, you know what? Let me do this, you guys. Let me 